the delta method is one of two primary methods used to produce forecasts that ultimately feed into the averaging and the calibration stages of CARD. The delta method, in fact, is divided into four different procedures for four cases. The four cases are going to depend on IRO and IA. So we'll first start talking about the case where IRO is 1 and IA is 0. So this is going to be data that looks like it has a random walk but has no seasonal. The key steps of the delta method are going to be a bunch of averages. So again, we're going to start from the Z data. The Z data are transform data. In this case, the Zs will be the differences of the Ys, and the Ys, of course, are either the logs or the levels of Xs. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a particular operator, this parentheses I, and there we're actually going to think about sorting the data. So not having a time series of data, but just ordering them. This is something we did, for example, when we looked at various quantile estimates in value risk estimation. And so we're going to order the data, and what we're going to do is compute a number of statistics. We're going to have D1, D2, and DR. So D1 is going to be a very simple estimate of the average. I'm actually missing some things here. Should be a 1 over t minus 2. Should be a 1 over t minus 4. So in other words, I forgot to divide by the sample size. So these are actually averages. These are averages. In fact, they're going to be growth rates, if we think of this being the difference of logs. And what we're going to do with D1, so just to write it out quickly, 1 over t minus 2 times the sum i equals 1 to t minus 2 of z. But importantly, it's not zt, but it's z with this little i. So in other words, it's going to use all of the values of z except zn. So it's not going to use the absolute largest, the, the zn that has the largest magnitude values. It's not going to use the largest growth rate of zn. It's going to do the average of all of the values, excluding the very largest one. You can think of this as being a somewhat outlier robust estimate or sort of trimmed estimate of the, of the growth rate of the series. D2 is going to do the same thing, except now it's going to be 1 over t minus 4 times the sum i equals 1 to t minus 4, again, of zi. This one is going to exclude zn, zn minus 1, and zn minus 2. So of course, we know that d2 is going to be, in some sense, even more robust because it's going to leave out the three largest in magnitude values of z when computing the trend. So these, these sort of simple estimates are going to be just average. They're going, to be like, they're going to be like trends or growth rates. And then finally, the third one we need is going to be dr, where r is going to be for recent. And there, we're just going to take the final six observations. Note here, importantly, that the it's not i anymore. It's actually t. So now we are looking at the actual six most recent time series observations of zt, that is, of the growth rate. So we want the final six that are available. There's a rule of thumb they use. If t is less than 6, so you have a particularly small sample, then you would simply set these all equal to d1. But I don't think we're going to see that in anything we try. So we have d1 is the average excluding the largest in magnitude change. d2 is the average excluding the three largest in magnitude changes. And dr is the average of the six most recent changes. So we're going to start by computing dm, which is the trend, as the usual way. In fact, just as the average of the z's. So the actual starting point is just to assume that the average is a reasonable estimate of the trend. But then we're going to robustify it. We're particularly going to robustify it using this, this new operator, which is called the signed minimum of a and b. So it's going to be the minimum of a and b times the fact that the sine of a is equal to the sine of b. So if the sine of a and the sine of b are both positive, then it's just the min of a and b. However, if a and b have different signs, that is one thing is positive, the other is negative, then it sets it to zero. And again, you think of this as being a robustifying step that if you have some disagreement between growth rates, then you're just going to assume the growth rate is zero. Additionally, if we start, so we start with dm. If t is larger than 2, and again, this should typo there, that should be 2m plus 1, then we're going to define a new sort of way to estimate the growth rate, 
which is going to be ds, which is going to be m inverse times the seasonal difference of zt. So we first start by writing delta m of zt. That's the average. But of course, that's going to be equal to zt minus zt minus m. So we want to divide that by m inverse. Multiply it by m inverse to make sure that it's sort of the average for a single year. And then we're going to simply sum t equals m to cap t of these. We divide this by t minus m. So in other words, we're taking the average of the m period differences. So it's a sort of year on year. If m was 12, you can think of it as a year on year growth rate, but average to monthly, which is what the m inverse does there. And then just taking the simple average of those. And this is just an alternative measure of the trend. But then we're going to apply this sine min to get the trend estimate is going to be the sine min of either dm, which is the overall mean monthly change, or ds, which is the one that's defined using seasonally difference data. So this is going to be a robustified mean that will we always know that we'll take the smaller of the two. And again, it may already be zero if you get different signs for these two estimates. We're then going to continue to rust, robustify things by taking dr star. So r star was the recent growth rate and defining it as, again, the sign min of the dr, which was the six most recent growth rates, and dm, where dm is either the z bar or possibly comes from this sign min there. And so once we have that, we're actually done. So the entire forecasting procedure without seasonalities is going to depend only on trend. That is, there's no autoregressive, there's no time series dynamics in this delta method. It's just going to be a very basic trend forecast. The only thing that makes it not basic is that it uses a lot of robustness to sort of find the smallest plausible trend. So it does, it's not looking, in some sense, it's, it's really worried about over forecasting the trend. So the one step ahead forecast of yt is just going to be yt plus the sign min of either dr star or d1. So this is going to be the one step ahead forecast. The two step ahead forecast is recursively defined using the previous forecast. Two or higher is recursively defined using the previous forecast plus the sign min now of dr star or d2. So again, a slightly more robust estimate. So after one period, you allow for a slightly higher growth rate. After two periods, you're always going to have a, a slightly lower growth rate because we know that D2 is always less than D1 by construction. And so that's it. That's it, that's it for the sort of the delta forecast. Again, only in the case where I rho equals 1 and IA equals 0. That is unit roots with no seasonality. Next, we'll turn attention to the case of unit roots with seasonality. There are going to be some differences here. So instead of relying on the monthly data, an example with when you had monthly data, we're going to use annual means to construct D1, D2, and DR. So the annual mean, again, thinking of this matrix that we defined before, where we had sort of, you know, ZT all the way through ZT minus M plus 1, and lots of rows that sort of look like that. The annual mean, of course, is going to be the average of a row. So it's m inverse, the number of seasons, times averaging across j, keeping i fixed. And we're going to get 1 for each value. So we'll have z tau. That would actually be z tau. z bar tau minus 1. z bar tau minus 2. All the way through z bar 1. So we're going to have tau of these. And these are going to be the inputs for estimating the growth rates where we just averaged across each row. This is some of the sense that this matrix structure is particularly useful here. We're then going to compute it, you know, compute D1 and D2 using the ordered values of Z bar I. And we're going to compute DR using the same idea here. Of course, instead of T, it's now tau. We simply use the six most recent annual growth rates. And again, now we're potentially going to have the problem that if tau is less than six, then we do need to use this rule. This will actually happen because tau will only be six if we have at least six years of data, and it's possible we'll have shorter time series than that. The forecasts themselves are very similar to what we saw before. In fact, the first part of both of the forecasts is exactly the same. Obviously, the estimates of dr star and di, these are different. 
So the seasonal effects are going to be the particularly new thing. We are going to use the fact that we know the final observation is the final column, so that when we do seasonal forecasts, we always know the one step ahead forecast will come from the first column. The two step ahead will come from the second column until we get to, to say, 12. Then we're going to wrap around back to the beginning. This is, again, something we've seen before. This is the function we need to make sure that when we take sort of h minus this, we're always going to be somewhere in the range of 1 to m. The last thing you do, though, of course, is estimate the seasonal effects. So the seasonal effects, they're going to use what's called a, a centered moving average, which is written as an MA 3 by 5 of the ZIJ. So again, this is also going to be using the matrix representation of Z. We're going to use a double moving average or a centered moving average of the two. And let's see if we can understand what a centered moving average is. So this is a centered moving average 3 of a moving average 5. So you obviously know what a five, what a moving average five is. It's simply going to be an average that's going to have you know one over five, 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 five times. So that's what we actually have in each row there. So you have one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. But then as we go back one observation, we back shift the weights one observation again, back shift again as we go to the third. So to do the MA3, we're going to need three moving average five terms. So we're then going to assign weight one third to each one of these terms there. And if we just multiply all the weights and sum down columns, we can get the weights on front of each of the observations. And we'll see that those weights are obviously one third times one fifth, one third times the sum of two of one fifths, one third times the sum of three of one fifths, and so on. So in other words, just we can easily see what all those weights should be. So you have one fifteenth, two fifteenths, three fifteenths, three fifteenths, three fifteenths, two fifteenths, and one fifteenth. So we have a trapezoidal structure to the weights, and that's what you get when you multiply everything out. However, you know we can see that tau is our last row. We don't have any data for tau plus three, tau plus two, or tau plus one. So the solution there is to assign all of that weight onto the final observation. So that means we're going to take the final three weights, which are all out of sample, and assign those to the final in-sample weight. And so when we add all that up, we see the effective weights of this MA 3 by 5 are going to be 9 fifteenths on the last value, then 3 fifteenths, 2 fifteenths, 1 fifteenth. So it still weights the most recent value very heavily, but it does do a limited amount of averaging across the three previous values from this matrix. So once we have these averages, the last thing we need to do is we need to simply demean them by the average of the averages. So when I want to actually get the estimate I'm going to use for forecasting, that is s hat j, I'm going to use s star j S star j comes from the MA 3 by 5. But then, of course, I'm going to have 12 of these for monthly data. And then I'm going to demean these by the average of those. And this is just to take out any level effects in the seasonality. So the seasonality doesn't have mean 0. Then what I want to do is I want to make sure I just remove the average effect of seasonality so we get the deviation from the long run average. So this is just a simple average of these SJs. And those are my estimates. So finally, when I finally have these values here, I would go back to my forecasting model and I would simply plug them in as needed. So the forecasts, again, are, are, are very straightforward. The only really key difference here is we obviously have to estimate the seasonal effects. The other thing we do is we estimate all of these other quantities from D using annual data. So we use annual data for D1, D2, and DR, and that will save us. That will that's needed because when we have seasonalities, we have annual periods in the data, and so we want to sort of avoid picking up that. We want to leave the seasonal effects to the seasonalities. Moving on, the stationary case, in fact, has a simpler forecasting method. So when we have the case where i rho is 0 and i a is 0, that's the stationary case with 
no seasonality. Then we're going to define this function mu r, which is simply going to be the average of the last r periods of the data, or if r is particularly big, that it would just be the average of all of the data. This is just a mathematical way to define that average. So in other words, you put an r in, you think of your data being sort of zt, zt minus 1, all the way through z1. So if your r block is smaller than the full sample, it's just the final r observations. If your block is larger, then you simply take t. So that's a simple way to define that. We then have really simple forecasts so that define m tilde to be the max of 2 or m. So in this case, with monthly data, you might think of m being 12. So then we're going to have y hat t plus 1 is going to be mu of m tilde. y hat, so in other words, is just the simple mean. The forecast is just a mean. Again, no autoregressive or other dynamics of the model. If we want to go more than one period ahead, so we take the average of the mean of the last m observations, and then 6 times m tilde. So for example, with monthly data, this might be 72, and m tilde would be 12. So we take an average of 12 months of data and 72 months of data, and that would be our forecast for the mean. Very, this is the simplest forecasting method of any of them when you have stationary data without seasonality. When we have stationary data with seasonality, when we have stationary data with seasonality, that is i rho equals 0, i a equals 1, then we're going to use an m a as well to compute the seasonality. The difference here is we use an MA7 cross 5, so it's a larger moving average. And again, this reflects the fact that we believe the series is broadly stable, and so we're less worried about using local data, and we're happier to use longer data. So when you actually work out what the MA7 by 5 is, using the intuition we developed a few slides ago, you'll see that the weights have this structure here, 20 over 35, and then 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 over 35. So these have a slightly longer tail, and they have slightly less weight on the most recent observation. But very similar structure. You know, probably would make much difference if you used the 3 by 5, but they recommend the 7 by 5. We then use, again, annual data. So call this mu sub a of r to do our forecast. So again, we define zi to be the row-wise average, thinking of this matrix of data from, you know, started with zt all the way through zt minus m plus 1. This is something we've seen now many, many times. Simply take the z bar tau there, z bar tau minus 1, so on, all the way through z bar 1. So we use the annual average there to be this function here. And again, this is the same idea there. You just use the minimum of tau or r observations, whichever is smaller. Then the forecast for the one step ahead is just the annual average for one period, plus the seasonality you estimate for the first period. The H step ahead forecast is going to be half of the one year and the six year average, plus, again, the seasonality estimate you have for the final period. So the delta method has, in fact, four special cases, one for each method, whether it's integrated or has a seasonality. And at the end of the day, all the forecasts are simple time trends plus seasonalities. There's no cyclical component included in the forecasts. This makes them particularly simple to compute, although one has to be very careful in estimate in implementing, although one has to be very careful in implementing the steps. The trend is estimated in a highly robust method, and all of these rules are ultimately going to shrink the trend towards zero. And each one of the cases has its own special forecasting method, and so it's important to get these preliminaries right.